Well, thanks for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. Um, so today, basically, uh, I want to circle the wagon, as it were. So I want to kind of create a very broad historical context in which peer-to-peer -peer and the commons are emerging. So I will only, in the next session, go into more details about what is peer production and open source communities. So today I want to uh, create more of a historical canvas, in which would make it more easy to understand next time why I think these things are important. So um, yesterday I did a two-hour um, recording of my of my life, <laughs> uh, and so basically, you know, it was about how did I become a social activist and these kinds of themes, but uh, I was explaining then in my in my younger years I was a Trotskyist uh, for about seven, eight years, late uh, teens and early 20s, um, and so I was very steeped in the theories of social change from that tradition. Um, and so I want actually to start with some ideas of, you know, why we can come to different conclusions about how societies change and what I learned about that time. So it, it may probably be a bit of a caricature, but I, I would still summarize the vision that I had at that time as, so we have a capitalist system, uh, and that capitalist system needs workers, uh, commodity labor, and it's basically kind of creating its own enemy, as it were. It's creating a class uh, that is learning the skills to manage society, to manage factories, and then one day we will basically take over uh, and change society. That I think is a bit of a caricature, but I think basically it's the correct summary. Um, so there's a number of problems with that uh, vision. Um, uh, one, of, one of them is that everything is centered around political revolution. So it's really centered on the idea that the world changes because there are political revolutions. And in particular, you know, with the one class and the leadership of that class playing the key role. But, you know, even if you look at the bourgeois revolutions that took place in Europe, like the 16th century um, uh, religious civil war in the UK, in Great Britain, you know, with or uh, not Orwell, what's his name? <laughs> uh, forgot his name now. Uh, Cromwell, um, and you look at, so there you see it's a religious civil war, which leads to the premises of the early capitalist system uh, in England. Uh, you could look at uh, Russia, and it's actually the Tsar who liberates the serfs, for, you know, before the, way before the Russian Revolution. You look at Germany, and it's the military class, they were called the Junkers, that actually reform Germany and make into a nation state, etc. So even the bourgeois revolution actually didn't uh, didn't conform to a, you know this kind of vision of you know pure political revolutions making the the key change. And so I think in general we are too obsessed with the idea of the fr the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution as the templates of change. While in actual fact, when we look at the transitions, there's a much broader possibility of different configurations uh, of change. So I think that's one thing. Um, a second issue um, I would point out with this vision is that it doesn't have a very strong vision of a prefigurative system. So in other words, you know, what, what is the system that the workers would initiate once they have the power, there is really no linkage with what comes before. Because before, workers are dependent on capitalism. They don't manage society. Uh, they don't self-organize many things. So, so in other words, um, and of course Marx knew this because he would not talk about what comes after it, right? He wouldn't talk about He said he refused basically to speculate about the post-revolutionary situation. But I think it's a real problem, because if you look at capitalism, it didn't have that problem. Capitalism took four or five centuries to develop. You know, we had uh, medieval cities. And of course, I use the Marxist uh, analysis of capitalism, so I'm not saying all markets are capitalism. You know, there were markets in China and everywhere in the world, but the specific configura configuration it would take 
you know, by separating workers from the means of production and, and, and private firms. This is particularly the capitalist form. You know, this was prefigured by four or five centuries of social development, right? So in other words, we got capitalism because we got capitalists. And capitalists knew exactly what they were doing because they had centuries of preparing institutions that fit their purpose, that they could manage. And so if you look at it that way, then you see that the political revolution comes after a long, long period of social change. It wasn't the beginning of the change. It's, it actually is the very end of the change, right? It's when they finally developed so much their capacity to organize society that they are strong enough to take over the state. Um, so, um, basically, my work started, so I, you know, I, I actually was a business person for a long while. I quit my militancy, and this is what we talked about yesterday, so I, I won't go into it today. But basically, after the mid-90s, I started feeling pretty bad about what I was doing. And, you know, I was asking the question, like, am I part of the problem or am I part of the solution? And I thought I was part of the problem. Um, as an executive in a telecommunications firm. And so remember the mid-90s, you see the Zapatistas, you see the alter globalization movement, you see climate change coming up as a, as a theme, uh, peak oil, peak resources. So all these themes coming, are coming up again after this long period of like neoliberal do, uh, dominance. It starts changing in the mid-90s. It's like a wave of critique that becomes stronger. Um, and so, so, okay, my, so I came to the, my question was, how do societies really change? If I want to be a militant again, an activist again, you know, I don't want to waste my time in things that don't work. And so I took a two-year sabbatical. And so what I started to do basically was to look at these transitions. And I must say, to be honest, I got stuck at the end of the Roman Empire, uh, 10th century, 15th century, and very Eurocentric. I'm really sorry about this, but, you know, I'm from Europe, so this is what we know. Um, so provincializing Europe, uh, also in a good sense, you know, it's where we are and it's what we know. So I'm going to give you some, I so some of my conclusions on when I looked at, at these transitions. And so the, the, I guess the main idea for me at that time was the idea of seed forms, yeah? That if it's true that capitalism came about because we had four or five centuries of, of capitalists, uh, then we have to look at their practices to actually know how this society came about, right? Um, so I just want to give a few examples of this. So I looked at the end of the Roman Empire around the fifth century. Um, so, the big change that we see in Europe after the 5th century, which is a, a kind of a unique, because if you look at Asia, you know, you have a cycle of civilization that many people have seen, like, uh, I think the first one to write about it was Ibn Khaldun, an Arab uh, historian and philosopher. And he kind of saw this kind of cycle where, you know, a civilization would rise, get stronger and stronger, but then get too big have too many expenses to keep their dominance, and then would slowly disintegrate. And then the barbarians on the outside would come in and basically start a cycle anew. So this cycle of civilizations going up and down, that was the case. Um, I think the, the end of the Roman Empire was a bit different because it actually took a long, long time to restart civilization, right? It wasn't this kind of fast uh, decline and a new civilization taking over. Um, and so the particular thing about Europe is that it stayed fragmented for an enormous time. This is very important. So there was no empire, no strong kings and royalties that could actually contain social change from, this, you know, from a, some kind of state position, right? Like, for example, disciplining the market. Um, and, but so one of the things that we see at the, at the end of the Roman Empire, which will become important later on, is, uh, is what we see happening around religion, basically. So what we see happening around religion is that a lot of the people who are leaving the cities um, 
they have two choices basically uh, one is to go to the the domains of the feudal lords and say you know okay I'll work for you and you'll protect me that's the social contract of feudalism uh, but the other uh, choice was to become a monk and you know at, depending on the countries and the time of history like up to 25 percent of the population could could be working in and around the monasteries right I think in Tibet it's 25 percent by the way or it used to be right so an enormous amount of people uh, went into these communities, these fraternal communities, which is already a big change because in the class societies of Rome and Greece, there are class hierarchies. It's all about this is pure patriarchy, right? It's it's uh, there's the idea of fraternity is actually a Christian uh, value, right? So you can create a group of people that are all brothers. That's something quite uh, interesting. Uh, but so here's what people do. So they they leave the cities, they go back to farming, and because Christian communities were not like the Buddhist monks, they were responsible for their own production, they had to work. So in, in Latin we say ora et labora, work and pray. But so they mutualize knowledge. So there's books about this, for example, there's a book by Jean Gimple called The First Medieval Industrial Revolution, it's showing that 90% technological revolution, evolutions came from the monks. Like the windmills, you know, all the technologies that were developed in that period were the monks. They were the, actually the educated and technical class. Because you had the serfs, they were illiterate, and then you had the warlords, they were not very literate either. <laughs> so it's basically this middle class, if you like, uh, of educated people that were the monks and they learned Latin, they could read and write, and they had time to think uh, and time to invent things. Okay. So what they also did is a second thing, uh, which is mutualize their resources. This is very important. Um, um, so in other words, if you look at, if you ever have a chance to visit Italy and look at some of the monasteries there, they're beautiful. And the thing is, they start and they say, okay, we vow obedience, we vow no sex, and we vow poverty, right? That's what they say. But after 100 years, they have the most beautiful buildings uh, in the region. And the reason is mutualization, right? So if you're a monk, you maybe you eat well, but you basically have you know, just a few set of clothes. Um, you have a little apartment, you have your bed, you have your table, you have your chair, uh, but you're living basically at a very light way of, you know, using material resources, right? And yet, because you, you farm and you get the tithes from the people around you, you accumulate resources. And these resources are not wasted on a ruling class, at least for a while you know, before you have rich bishops and stuff, but at least for a while they are... So every, reinvesting everything in their own development, in their own resources. This is why after 100 years, monasteries are always the richest in the region. And it's basically living a middle-class life because the serfs and the peasants are, are still living in huts. And the lords are living in palaces, but the monks are living in houses, right? They have a stone house, stone apartments. Um, but so... I hope you still follow me. What I'm trying to say is that mutualization is the answer to the collapse of civilization. This is a very important point. And there is a study which confirms this. It's called Handy, Human and Nature Dynamics. Uh, and this is a long-term uh, history of the collapse of civilization. So basically, what these researchers noted is that every civilization collapsed. Everyone. Otherwise, we would still have the Han Dynasty and the Sung Dynasty and the Roman Empire. They're not there because they all disappear, right? So all civilizations collapse, very important point. Um, and so he also notes, uh, so they use this kind of dynamic between uh, predator-prey. Yeah? So you have, let's say, the gazelles and the tigers. Let's say the working classes and the managerial classes, right? So the basic idea is the following. The more... Um, so you have a lot, first you have a lot of gazelles and then you have 
the, the tigers. And there's more and more tigers, and they eat more and more and more, right? So you reach a point where the tigers are starting to eat so many gazelles that the gazelle population collapses, and then the tigers have no food. So this is what happens basically with civilization. So in, in any what's called a peer polity, which means a, a competing system of peers, so empires and kingdoms fighting with each other to get dominance, they are going to overuse their own resources, their own resource base. So every empire tends to overeat its own resource bases. Um, some examples are uh, Japan in the 12th century. I don't know too many details about it, but there's a really nice book about it. It's called uh, Ecological Revolutions and the Eggshell Religions from Mark Whitaker. He's based in Seoul. And so in 12th century Japan, it was basically deforested. Um, so, you know, they, had, they kept cutting the wood, which was like the oil of that time, kept cutting the wood until the woods were like really receding and only left in the mountains. And so you have an ecological crisis. And if you look at the history of Japan, like all these new Buddhist sects, like Nichiren and, and you know, I'm not an expert, but anyway, they actually emerge around these time periods as an, again, as an answer to the resource crisis and to the civilizational crisis. Um, so you see in Japan, 12th century, exactly the same thing happening as at the end of the Roman Empire in the 5th century, right? Mutualization. Uh, there's a religious re revival, a religious revolution. Uh, people leave the cities and the emperor in, in Japan gets stronger and basically takes control of the, the land. So, in other words, the land becomes a commons and the land is protected by the emperor from further degradation. So by the time of the 15th century, you go back to Japan, everything is green, right? So this is a very important dynamic, right? Um, another story you might know about is this book that came out a few years ago. It's called 1493, which is about the Chinese fleets. It's a bit controversial, but you know the story? So uh, there's this one emperor in China, and he says, you know, go forth and discover the world. And we have five Chinese fleets that start going out. According to this book, and there's a lot of proof actually for this, so they find Chinese DNA of chickens, you know, uh, from chickens that date way, way, way back. Um, so they think they know, there's more and more proof that this is true. So the Chinese actually discovered in America. Um, so there's a Chinese fleet, went to Africa, another went to the United States. This emperor, in order to do this, was also, had almost completely deforested Manchuria, right? So I don't know if you know this story. So when he came back, when these fleets came back, they basically had a revolution before they came back. So by the time the fleets came back, they just destroyed all the ships and they closed down China for a while. So the same, the same dynamic you have, right? So you have a, a civilization which eats too much of its resource base. And as an answer, there is this kind of return to, uh, and it, it historically it takes the form of a religious movement. And if you look at Buddhist monks, Christian monks, they're ecological, right? It's all about harmony. It's all about disciplining the ruling class to a communal ethics, right? The emperor cannot do what he wants because there's a higher order. There's ethical values that are, that are stronger than the will of the power to do everything they want, right? So if you can see this. Uh, this is another way to look at history as a spiral, right? So you have, let's say, animal, hum animal humanity, which is, you know, the, the right of the strongest, like in the chimpanzees. You know, the, st the strongest male get everything. But then we have the tribal hunter-gathering societies, right? So there is a shift from power logic to communal logic, right? It's all about your family in the tribe. You have a small band. Uh, it's very, it's relatively equal. And then we have the big men that come out of this system and starts creating uh, kingdoms and empires and state systems, right? So this is goes going... It's going back to the individual power thing, right? Then we have the religious revolutions, the Buddhist revolution, the, the Christian revolution. 
This is going back to communal. Then we have the Renaissance, which is going back to adventure, individual exploration. Do you, I hope you can see this, but there's a dynamic there, right? It's like society goes to one, one polarity, exaggerates that polarity, creates problems, and then there is a broad reaction and society is, is, is moving to the other polarity. And probably that creates then its own problems, maybe stagnation or something. And so you have this, this kind of spiral dynamic uh, in human history. Um, so there is an interest, so, okay, so this is an interesting point that whenever you have civilizational collapse, you have re of society. So just, just anticipating what I will tell the next time, but think about it, what's happening today. Today we have global open source communities. What are they doing? They're mutualizing knowledge. We have uh, free software, uh, we have co-working, we have fab labs, we have makerspaces. What are they doing? They're mutualizing infrastructures, right? And then instead of feudal domains, we have um, 3D printing and so all these kinds of distributed manufacturing infra, uh, production systems coming up. So I hope you can see there's a pattern there, right? There's a pattern of overuse in class societies and then you have these reactions and it's, it's about always about mutualization. So of course I will argue that this is exactly where we are today. So we have today a world civilization which is an overshoot and we have a world reaction, a global reaction to this overshoot, which is the re of social practice, right? Um, so I'm, I'm going back to my point about seed forms. So we see, you know, mutualization of knowledge, we see mutualization of infrastructure, and we see relocalization. This is fifth century after the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, the 10th century is less well known, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it because um, I don't think this is widely known, but this was also a time of revolution in Europe. So what happens in the 10th century, and this is described in a really nice book, it's called The First European Revolution um, uh, by Richard Moore. So just to paint a picture. Uh, so, most people think the Roman Empire collapsed in the 5th century and then everything went bad. It's a bit more complicated because actually what happens is a fragmentation, but the political structure of the Roman Empire survive. Until the 8th century, you still have Roman soldiers, you know, with their Roman attire, you have Roman systems, uh, you still have cities. Um, it's actually the Muslims in the 8th century which, which uh, isolate Europe because they take control of the Mediterranean, so no more ships. And so if you look at the Frankish kingdoms, the Germanic kingdoms at the, after the 8th century, they hardly have any ships. That's why the Vikings, you know, the, the Nordic people, they could come in Europe, you know, burn the monasteries because Euro European peoples had no defense against these ships. Um, the capitals of these people were nomadic. So the Frankish kings, they didn't stay in one place, they moved around. The farmers were nomadic until the 10th century. And it was also a time of enormous abuse. So the, 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 king, the not the kings, the, the knights, the early knights were called militia. You know, they would just take whatever they wanted. So they would rape the women, uh, burn the churches, get the gold. So by the ninth, by 975, we have a social revolution in Europe. It's called the Peace of God movement. And notice the religious theme, right? It's against the religious revolution. And so basically, the monks of Cluny, which is like the, the strongest community of monks in France, organized demonstrations with the Virgin Mary on front at a time where everybody is really deeply religious and deeply believing in, in these things, right? And they start confronting the rulers with their sins. They basically say, why are you raping our women? Why are you stealing the gold from our churches? And this is very successful. So uh, this, these are called the Peace of God Accords. And there's like 600 of them in, in 40 years. And basically, the main thing is, the main agreement is, you won't believe it, but it's true. Make love, not war. 
So what it means is that the ruling class promises to marry each other rather than to fight each other, right? So it's a pacification of the feudal competition. So if you want to grow, if you can marry the daughter of your rival, but you know, instead of fighting, this is one thing. Second thing is called primogeniture. I don't know if you're familiar with primogeniture. So it's the right of the firstborn, right? So if you have egalitarian systems of inheritance in a rural society, what happens is that you fragment the land, right? Until it's so fragmented that you can't survive. So egalitarianism is not always, not always a good thing, especially with an individual, right? Individual egalitarianism. So if you're familiar with Rwanda, with the, with the genocide in Rwanda, this was caused by this, right? In Rwanda, they had fragmented the land just can, until the moment where it was just impossible for many people to survive, and that's when the civil war, you know, exploded. Anyway, so primogeniture arises when the land is full. Yeah? This is just not, not just in Europe, this is everywhere. So the, the right of the firstborn means that you're the Lord, your land goes to the first son, firstborn son, nobody else gets anything. So this is a way to protect property uh, in, in a system that depends on land. It also creates a surplus, right? Because if you're the third, the second, the third son, or the second, the third daughter, what do you do? So one of the things you can do is go to the church. Yeah? Um, I don't know if you're interested in this, but I'll, I'll tell it anyway. So imagine this. You have the Roman Empire. You have the Germanic invaders. Yeah? And they say to the Romans, you can't bear any arms. So what do you do if you're Roman and you have children? You educate them in the church. So the bishops are the Romans. That's why the Roman Empire actually continued in the Catholic Church. It's the same structure. It's the state. The Catholic Church was the Roman state with the same people. It's just they didn't have arms, so they were monks and bishops, right? So that's one thing you do. The second thing you do is you go to war. So everywhere where primogeniture emerges, you get warrior societies. You know, you get, because where does all the young people go? They don't have land. Well, you send them out on the crusades. That's exactly what happened. Uh, and also the surplus in the countryside created the cities. So this is the time, 975, social contract. And the people go, basically, the cities come up again. So in three centuries, we have a doubling of the European population. We have a tripling of the uh, West European population. We have a five-day working week in Europe. Sunday, the day of the Lord, and Monday, Blue Monday, the day of the family. Yeah? The women in the cemeteries are taller than today. So this is a sign of good food, healthy diet, etc., etc. So this is kind of a, a little first golden age between the 10th and the 13th century in Europe. And based, you know, largely also on the reorganization of the church. I don't know if you know this, but uh, we, in Catholicism, we talk about the Gregorian reforms, yeah, around the 11th century. This is, for example, when uh, the churches could be private property until then, and the priests were married which meant the property of the church would seep out to the, to the rulers, to the feudal class. Once you say the priest cannot marry, the property stays within the church, right? And then as part of the pacification, the feudal start competing in the gifts to the church. If you give to the church, the monks will pray for you, and you'll be saved, right? So this kind of idea is the same as in Buddhism with, indult with uh, merit making. Okay. Um, uh, just very briefly, um, I was recently reading a really interesting book. It's called the, the Industrial Religion. And it's basically the theme of this book by Pierre Musso. It's a French book. I don't think you can read it. <laughs> it's, and it's like 600 pages. Is that... No society can be entirely rational. So in other words, reason is always around myth. Even today in highly rational capitalist societies, so always myth is the basic thing. So for example, if you're a scientist and you say, we, uh, you know, I'm a subject 
and I'm studying the object, the objective world, th there's no way you can prove this, right? This is, this, is a, this is a philosophical presupposition that we live in a world with subjects and objects, right? Then you can be rational about science, but your premise is not provable. Does that make sense? So, in other words, there's always myth, even rational myth, at the heart of any society. And so the book basically is about how the idea of incarnation, so, you know, God becomes a human body, becomes in a second step nature. So what happens in the evolution of Christianity is that nature becomes very important. The respect for nature, the study of nature, because nature is an expression of the divine. So this is weird, right? This is materialism emerging out of religion. Yeah, the, and so the, the way to see it is that uh, you have animism, everything is sacred. Then you, in polytheistic religions, it gets condensated in, in gods and goddesses. Uh, then in monotheistic religions, it gets even more condensated in one all-powerful divine figure. And so the thesis of this book is once you have this, basically you empty the world of the sacred. So it's a paradox that a religion creates materialism, right? The idea that we live in an objective world. So then uh, the, the uh, stress moves from nature to humanity. That, that happens in the 18th century, when we start saying humanity, progress, all these ideas. So uh, anyway, he describes this shift. And just one particular little thing I want to tell you, which is an interesting story. So the first monks are called Benedictines. And so the idea is work and pray, but they're very clever. They make other people work so that they can pray, right? And so then comes St. Bernard, which is, uh, I think, around the 11th century. And he says, this is wrong interpretation. We have to work and pray. And here's the interesting thing. Since we owe everything to the divine, we have to pray as much as we can. But... In order to pray as much as we can, since we have to feed ourselves, we have to work very efficiently, right? So this is the invention of productivity. There are prayer maximizing enterprises. Uh, but, and they use the work to liberate them from the work. So they become, if you look at these, these monasteries, they are the first factories. They, they, do, uh, they have the forges, they do metal, they do the coins, they do everything. So these are the, the primary agent of technological progress at that age. Um, anyway, okay, so let me now go to the 15th century. Uh, so you have 10th century seed forms that they are emerging that create this big um, uh, shift uh, back to the cities, back to the first uh, industrial revolution. Uh, fifth century is, is more interesting because that's where, where we see capitalism emerging, right? So we have the cities. So one of the things that happens is if you're a Christian, if you're a Jew, um, even if you're a Muslim, you can actually not lend money because usury is a sin. And when, when, we, when they say usury at that time, they don't mean high interest, they just mean interest, right? Except for the Jewish people, they say, we can lend money to others, not to ourselves. So the Jewish people become the bankers, right, of, of the medieval cities. But of course, a lot of Christians say, why, why would they be the only ones that do this? So why can't we do it, right? So this kind of pressure uh, is there. And so what you see over three centuries is ideological invention of purgatory. It didn't exist. So you would, you know, you're a Christian. You live on earth, you die, you go to heaven or hell. And suddenly, and it takes three centuries, you, I read a book about it, it's called The Invention of a Purgatory. It's a really fun, fascinating book. It's how slowly but surely people start saying, well, actually, there's an in-between. Not everything is a deadly sin, right? So this creates a possibility for becoming a merchant. You can be a Christian and a merchant. And so what happens there is... Okay, I'm going to be a banker, I'm going to be a businessman, I know it's not good for my soul, but then I go to the church and I buy an indulgence, which is like merit making, and you give to the church, they will pray for you, but they'll actually give you a paper 
which says, you know, uh, for that kind of money, your bad credit is diminished so far, right? I, they still do this in Thailand. My, my grandmother, my wife's, uh, my mother-in-law has one. It's like a credit card. You go to the temple and you get the write down, right? You, that, you get married. So this is how we build the, the Gothic cathedrals, by rich people uh, buying these indulgences. Uh, okay, so this is a seed form for capitalism. The, uh, accounting, actually purgatory is accounting, right? When you start counting the sins, it's very similar to counting your money. And just a brief idea about accounting, why it's so important. Uh, I talked about this yesterday very briefly, but so the, the first writing we find in history is actually a ledger. So actually writing comes from counting. Um, so basically the temple in, in Mesopotamia, that we're getting the, the rice from the farmers, keeping it, uh, and then, you know, every, ten, every year some of the rice goes bad, so you lose some of it. So you, you would get a piece of paper, actually a piece of stone, that would say how much rice you, you could get back. And so basically this is the invention of the state. So once we have accounting, we know we have the state. We have something outside of the direct practice of people that manages their resources or on behalf of them, right? So, th so that's why accounting is very important. Uh, and this is the second step. This is a, I forgot his name, but this is a Franciscan monk who creates the first treatise of double entry book accounting. Now, double entry book accounting is very important as a seed form because you start looking at the world in a different way. Uh, so think about the feudal lords, the warlords. What they would do in Europe is go to war, have a big party, yeah? Spend everything on a big feast. There's no input and output. It's just showing off, competing, gifting to the church, having big festivals. So the surplus gets used up. This is not good if you're a capitalist, right? You, you need to augment resources. It becomes, capital becomes important. So double entry book accounting tells you what comes in, tells you what goes out, but it tells you primarily what goes up inside your own firm, your own individual property, right? So this is for the first time looking at the world in terms of individual accumulation. It's a very important step. You can be, you can be a capitalist without this, right? So, the negative thing about it, which is why we now have new forms of accounting coming up, is that there are no, there's no ecosystem, there's no externalities. Double entry book accounting is purely a selfish vision of the world. You know, my entity, how is my entity doing in the world? With this kind of accounting, we can't do anything about the environment. It doesn't, doesn't work, yeah? Okay, so printing press, also very important as a seed form. So I, okay, I hope you get the picture by now. The idea is that societies actually change because one system is in crisis, like a dominant logic no longer works, and people look for solving their issues or innovating using a different logic. The double entry book accounting is not a feudal logic. The printing press is not monks writing down, taking days and weeks to copy just one book so that only a small minority knows Latin and, and knows how to read the books. Suddenly, everybody can read, right? Um, so one more thing to close down, this. So it turns out, this is a, a really nice book, Montaillou. Uh, it, it's based on the Inquisition. Um, so, you know, you have heretics and then the judges from the church come in and they start interviewing everybody. So they found this enormous amount of anthropological material to show life in a village in France in the 13th century. And so what they see is that these people had an enormous amount of holidays, like 150 or 130 religious holidays. You know, weren't working much in the winter and stuff like that. Uh, so, and these people were not disciplined. They were, they were disciplined to the cycles of nature. You know, it's the, the sun comes up, I get up. It's dark, we have no light, go to sleep, right? This kind of life. The only people who were disciplined in Europe were the monks. They had to pray seven times a day, 
you know, uh, with with the clock, with the the church bell, with the solar. Um, and so when Luther, the Reformation abolishes the monks within the Reformation, what he does is he opens up society to live like the monks. Does that make sense? Because suddenly all these disciplined people, they have no place to go. They are back in society. So in a way, you can see in many ways our, how religion was shaping capitalism as, you know, in a very important way because of that discipline uh, came from uh, the original uh, way. Okay, uh, so these are the seed forms and then maybe an important point to how we eventually came to capitalism is that Karatani, Kojin Karatani, I will talk about it more later. He's a fantastic uh, Marxist uh, historian in Japan. Wrote a a really nice book called The Structure of World History. And he says the reason capitalism emerged, especially in Europe, is because the state was weak, right? There was a fragmented sovereignty. So in other words, you look at the cities, they were uh, free cities, they had social charters, they were run by the guilds, the worker guilds and the merchant guilds. They were Soviets, basically. Uh, and, and of course they would play power games with the bishops and the kings and, and so what, what happened is that in Europe the merchants could grow their own culture, their own institutions unimpeded by royal and imperial control, right? So this is why we eventually got capitalism. There was a very specific situation make the market dominant over the other forms. So in the 18th century, uh, we have this kind of balance. We have the absolute kings, as we call them in Europe, because the feudal class was going down, the bourgeois class was coming up, and so nobody was strong enough to dominate, and then that's why then the kings become the ultimate arbiters of social conflict. And that's why they're so strong in that period. Then you have the bourgeois revolutions, and it shifts. Okay. Um, I want to spend some time now on what I call relational theory, uh, which is one of the basics of my approach. And this involves both Caritani and another person called Fisk. Um, I'm trying to, Alan Page Fisk. Okay, Fisk has a theory of relations. And he has basically four, he distinguishes four modes of, of relationships which Caritani calls modes of exchange. The, you will see there is a strong connection between the two. Um, Fiske doesn't historicize them, but I will, and Caritani does them as well. So he says there's always, in any civilization, even in tribal, uh, for, in tribal civilizations, if you want to call them that way, four ways of allocating resources. This is what it's about. How do people allocate resources in a society? The first one is actually communal shareholding, the commons. I will define it later. But communal shareholding is any time you exchange with the totality. Uh, so I'll give an example, which is actually, I think it's mentioned by Fisk. So you live in a hunter-gathering uh, tribe, small band of people, 40, 50, 60 people, maybe less, and a group of men go hunting. Okay, they catch a gazelle, they come back to the tribe. It's not for the hunter. It's not for his wife and kids. It's for the community. So there will be some rules that will say, you get the leg, you get, you know, whatever, you get the head. And actually, often the hunter is the last one to choose the piece of meat because he has all the prestige. So to compensate the prestige, he gets less, right? So this is typical for fairly egalitarian uh, tribal bands and so the important thing here is that you share with the totality right you you this a, you're an individual but you share with something that is a whole so to put it today if you're a Linux developer and you write a piece of software and let's say you're not paid you're a volunteer you, you write the code because you want to solve your problem 
right? So you're not working for IBM or anything. So you give the code to Linux. And what does Linux give you back? Nothing. But you can use Linux, right? So the idea is give a brick, get a house. So this is the advantage of communal, of communal shareholding. It's mutualization. It's sharing as some kind of collective, right? So, you, so this is very important because this is not the gift economy. So I'm coming now to the gift economy. Um, so, uh, so I'm mixing Fiske and Karatani here. So let's assume that um, you know, people start experimenting with growing things and they become horticultural. And so they start sedentarization. And interestingly, Karatani argues that sedentarization precedes agriculture. So the first step is sedentarization. Um, how do you keep the peace when you cannot flee conflict? Right? This is the question he asks himself. So you have different villages and you have conflict. Maybe you think this is your, you know, your hunting ground or your piece of land. So he says you do this through the gift economy. Giving creates peace. So basically giving, and, and so he calls it equality matching. This is very interesting because it's not what we think. We think giving, but actually by giving, you create inequality. So I've lost good friends that way. I gave them something, they feel guilty, and, I, and we never hear about them. Why? Because you give them something, they feel bad. They feel obliged to give something back. So the gift economy is that. Equality matching is... I, I organize a potlash like the Native Americans, big, big festival. You know, all the tr neighboring tribes are invited. You give them as much as you can. Everybody says, wow, this is, uh, you know, generous people, very successful. Uh, so next year, it's your turn. You invite your neighbors and you try to make a better festival, a bigger festival than the ones the year before. So this is a dynamic a competitive dynamic. Gift economy is actually a competitive dynamic. But what it does, it creates social bonds. By giving, you create an obligation of return, right? So if you, if you follow Karatani, he would say that the early human history is dominated by communal shareholding. Uh, so nomadic bands, once you have settled tribes, so complex tribal societies, it's dominated by the gift economy. Not the market, not communal shareholding, but the gift. This is, so by gifting, and a very complex system of gifting, there are islands where you know, I give to you, but you don't need to give back to me, you give to another person, but eventually after 15 people will come back to me. So there are more complex gift economies, but it's always the same. It creates an obligation and a social bond. So then you have to explain uh, how domination emerges in this, in this situation. And nobody really knows, although actually there are new books about it. One is a new book, I haven't read it, by James Scott, who writes about the, how the state emerges. I haven't read it, can't tell you much about it. Uh, but it's supposed to be a very detailed vision of the emergence of the state in Mesopotamia, but I, I can't tell you. But Karatani has a following hypothesis which is also borne out, out by a lot of uh, research. So let's assume that there is some climate event. You're hungry, yeah? The only way to survive is stealing, taking things from your neighboring tribe, right? So one tribe attacks another and takes the resource of the other tribe. How can you give a gift economy in this situation? You can't, right? Because if I take it from you by violence, there's no giving anymore, right? So that's when you have tributary systems, right? So this is, he calls it authority ranking. Authority ranking is once you have allocation systems that are divided by rank. I have a PhD. I actually don't have one, <laughs> but you have one. So you outrank me you're going to earn 30% more when you have a job than me. It's, it's authority ranking. I'm a duke. I'm better than you, the count. I'm a count. I'm better than you, the baron. You know, or captains and colonels, whatever. So, 
So once you have violence in class society, you have authority ranking. And the market is still marginal, right? So according to David Graeber, a fantastic book, 5,000 Years of Debt, in, in his theory and his research shows that it's the state that creates the market to pay the soldiers, right? Because once you have to, once you have armies and they travel around, they need food. And if you don't want to make other people angry because you steal their food, you start using money. You say, okay, I'll take your food, but here's money. Yeah? So the, the state creates money to pay for the food, and that creates a market economy. But it's marginal compared to the tribute that people pay to the king, like 50% of your production goes to the, you know, the feudal lord for protection. Um, so market comes last, right? And so I, I go back to this theory of Karatani where it needed a special situation, a European situation, for markets to become the dominant form. But so here's a theory. Every society is a mixture of modes of exchange. But there's always one dominant mode. So if you have a communal shareholding nomadic tribe, they may have a bit of gifting, but the most important thing is the, is the communal shareholding. If you have a gift economy, you have a bit of uh, communal shareholding still there. You might have a bit of a market with other tribes. You might have a chief and ritualistic authority ranking, but very limited. It will all be there, but there's one dominant mode, right? So this is very important to come to my own theoretical conclusions. So I think you came late, so you didn't hear this. So in the beginning, I was talking about when civilization collapses, you have remutualization. You have kind of a, a pendulum uh, between collapsing societies which overreach and then mutualization to bring down the thermodynamic costs uh, of social life. Um, so Karitani would say that today we live in a capital state nation system, right? It's three in one, it's the holy trinity. Um, and he, he shows how they co-emerge, right? The state and the nation and capitalism are basically part of the same thing. Um, he also explains why it is so strong, because if you attack the state, you have the nation and, and, and capital. If you attack the nation, you have... So attacking either one of these three pillars generates a counter-reaction of the system to maintain it. Um, and, uh, okay, so, so my theory, which I'll explain later, is that because of civilizational overshoot at a global scale, second, because the nation state can no longer control capital, we are in a systemic crisis, which means that that same system cannot solve our problems. So f to understand this, we need to understand maybe Karl Polanyi, uh, the Great Transformation, and his idea of a double movement, right? So his uh, basic idea is, this is like a pendulum on a smaller scale, uh, basically around the conjurative cycles, if you're familiar with them, so about 50, 60 years of high growth and low growth, ar around one industrial paradigm, systemic crisis, 1873, 1929, 2008, and then a new cycle with a different combination within capitalism. Um, so the, what usually happens is the following. So the, f the first period after the systemic crisis, you have a new combination of management, land, uh, use of land, uh, or, um, financial organization. It all fits together and creates a boost uh, for the economy. These periods are good for labor, right? Because if you have high growth, you need a lot of workers. makes the workers stronger. This, is, this explains the welfare state period in Europe, right? Super high growth after 45. You need a lot of workers. They're afraid of the Soviet Union. So they're obliged to make these social welfare compromises with the working class. This is expensive for capital. So after the period of welfare state, what you get is supply crisis because capital is not making enough profit. 
right? So they will organize a counter-revolution within this cycle, yeah? This is the 1980s. So in the 70s, you have the oil crisis, you have inflation, the welfare system is in crisis. And you have Thatcher and Reagan that mobilize their, their support to break the, the welfare state cycle. And they inaugurate the second cycle, which is a low growth period, weakening working class, but good for capital. So what do you get after the end of a neoliberal cycle? And so we had, it wasn't called neoliberalism, it was called laissez-faire, but this is kind of a, the sixth time we are having this, or the fifth time. What do you get after these 30 years? You get a demand crisis, which is what we have now, right? People have no money. Um, so so he, the double movement for him is this pendulum, right? So you have strong labor, creates a pendulum, the reaction, capital takes back the dominance, and you create a demand crisis. This mobilizes labor, and so you have the, so according to Polanyi, it's about embedding and disembedding the market in society. And it's about the nation mobilizing the imagined community of capitalism. It's about the nation mobilizing to force the state to re-embed the market in that trinity, right? You following my reasoning? Yes? Okay. And so this doesn't work anymore, right? This is a system that is in crisis. Because capital is transnational. So today we see, on the one hand, left-wing populism, Sanders, Corbyn, oh, what's the name again, Octavio Cortez, right? These kind of people, they're mobilizing the people to have a new kind of left-wing progressive reform uh, aim, right? At the same time, we have Trump and Brexit and uh, Orban and Poland, and they represent a right-wing populist version. But they're both trying in different ways the same thing. They're mobilizing the nation to make the state do certain things. In the case of Trump, so I think a good way to explain it is what Clinton, Hillary Clinton was for as a neoliberal, fairly but progressive person was to strengthen the empire at the cost of the nation. In other words, the, the working class is going down in the United States since 30 years. They have trailer parks, you know, opioids, uh, addiction. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. And Clinton didn't care. This is neoliberal globalization. This is the price we pay for globalization, right? So she doesn't identify with her nation working class. She identifies with the knowledge working class, with the cultural creatives, with the people who are the better off with globalization, not the people who are worse off. And I think Trump is just the opposite. Trump says we're going to sacrifice the, the empire in order to maintain the nation, right? This is, this is what they're fighting about. This is the, the struggle. So it's two factions of the ruling class that are basically fighting each other. And one more thing we could say today is that if the welfare state was an alliance between the leadership of labor and the ruling class around the social contract which said, okay, we'll give you pensions, we'll give you health care, but you listen to us when you work, right? So it's subordination under capitalism against security. This is the deal. If you work, no self-organization, you, you follow the commands of capital, but if we grow in productivity, you'll have a share of that growth product. This was a social contract in the welfare state. The social contract of the of neoliberal state is different. It is, so remember 1968, but also the Cultural Revolution, Kent State, the anti-war movement. So this is the young people at the time revolting against hierarchical structures. Millions of workers were on strike in France. President de Gaulle was actually fleeing to Germany. He thought it was finished. 
Yeah, he, so he fled the country. But how did it end up? What's, what's the deal? The deal was, you middle class youth, you can have your rock and roll. You can have your cultural revolution. You can have your identity uh, demands, right? So women's rights, gay rights, this is one thing. This is okay, you'll get it. But working class people were told, we can't afford to do this. We're gonna close the factories. We're going to the global south. So this is the neoliberal social contract at the cost of the European working class. Um, so, okay, here's what I'm proposing. Um, so if we cannot reform capital state nation, what do we do? So what we cannot do, according to me, if you believe this theory of the four modes of exchange, we cannot just say, let's have the state take over, right? Because this would mean just one modality. This is not, how, this is not what history shows us. What history shows us is rearranging of the relations between these four modalities. So my idea, which I will explain later, is we need to move, and I believe we are moving, to a situation where communal shielding becomes again the core of our society. In other words, the commons. Yeah? So this is the core. This is, I'm anticipating what I will say later on. Today, if you look at the open source economies and the blockchain ecosystems and all of these things that are emerging, we're moving from a situation that where we have commodity labor working for capital accumulation. This is the old form of industrial capitalism. I actually would argue that the Soviet system was just another form of this. We still had workers, we still had managers, we still had capital. It was different, but it was also the same. Right? It was a, an alternative within the same paradigm. Um, today, so here's I would, what I would argue, that the value is moving towards contributions to shared resources. The whole open source economy, which is one-sixth of GDP already in the United States, and 70 million workers in 2011, is based on people collaborating on shared resources. Open geographical data, open software, open all of this. So IBM became a Linux company. Right? It shifted from making computers, which it sold to Lenovo, to basic consulting around free software systems. Okay, now they're shifting again to, to data, to being a data company. But 15 years ago, they shifted around this notion of a commons of code with all the other companies doing similar work. So they moved from pure individual competition to participating in an ecosystem of collaboration around a core of jointly used open source software, right? So the, the capitalist value that they are, are taking from this is derived from the strength of this common core. It's very clear if you look at Google, Facebook, Uber and Airbnb. Let's do that exercise. What is Google producing? Nothing. They are, so we are producing the documents, right? But we are also producing the data. The data is, Google is not making the data. It's our interactions which are producing the data, right? And then they're selling the data. But in other words, their, their capitalism is derivative of our production, right? So one way to explain this would say we are moving from a Marxist capitalism based on commodity labor and surplus value directly exploited from the work to a system based on Proudhonian capitalism. So in the 19th century, there was a big debate between Marx and Proudhon. And Proudhon was arguing that surplus came from cooperation. So he was saying, you have 100 craftspeople. If you put them together in a factory, they will be more productive because they're working together in one system. So that's different from Marx, right? Marx stresses the individual worker, uh, what he gets, and the surplus is for capital. Proudhon 
stress the fact that the service came from human cooperation. So here's my argument that we are shifting from a system based on commodity labor to a system based on the direct exploitation of human cooperation. So what I call netarchical capitalism, the hierarchy of the network, is a shift in the capitalist system towards directly exploiting network value, cooperative value. This is, in my view, what they're doing. So let's take Facebook. What are they producing? A platform, sure. But without us, it's absolutely worthless, right? So we are producing the value for Facebook by our interactions, and they're selling our data. Uber and BNB, it's slightly different. So here we are in the sharing economy, uh, and what we call idle sourcing, right? So this is what, so this is uh, important to discover because capitalism was a commons enclosing, commons destroying system in the past. And of course, they're still doing that in Africa and land grabbing. There's still a lot of commons destruction. But the latest forms of capitalism are actually making peace with the commons. They have understood that, the, that this commonification, this mutualization, is in their interest as well. So it's a paradox, but Facebook is enabling two billion, soon four billion people to communicate together, to share things, knowledge together, and to self-organize. Even as it is an extractive, centralized ownership. But they're still allowing, you know, I, I live in Belgium, we have a community fisheries uh, uh, project that work with Facebook, right? So the, the fishermen come in, come in the port of Ostend, you, they tell you already on the computer what they have. You can order your fish, and you get your fish directly. It's all done on Facebook. So, but this is actually a good thing in a paradoxical way. I think alternatives grow, first of all, because they're useful to the old ruling class. So if you look at the emergence of strong kingdoms in Europe later on as a preparation for the nation state, is because they, were, they used the cities. They used the money made in the cities so that the kings could become strong and then the feudal lords, right? So in other words, captains could grow because even in the old uh, structure, people saw that it was good for them and they supported it. And in the same way, the commons is growing today in a paradoxical way because capitalism is seeing it's in their own interest. And this is important to to understand. Now, this is not a simple, of course. I will um, start to explain in the next sessions how an emancipatory strategy can use this and then can fight within this new configuration to get more resources to the commons against Natarkalka capital, right? But this is another, we'll explain later. But so this is not necessarily a negative. So I think the fact that capitalism is embracing the commons is part of what makes a shift towards a common-centric society more likely in the future. Um, okay, uh, how, much, how long did I speak now? 45 minutes. 45 minutes? Okay. I, yes, I'm going to maybe take 5 or 10 minutes more. Get a of the water. Um, so I, I'll just start today already by defining the commons and peer-to-peer. -peer. Oh, uh, or maybe telling you first an evolution of the commons. So I gave you an evolution of political socioeconomic systems, right? The four phases. And I want to kind of say what happens with the commons in that, in that context. So first of all, we have non-capitalist class systems. And I just push them in one, one box for the moment. This is the period of natural resource commons. So even under feudalism, we have land as a commons. So the, I don't know the situation in Asia, but in Europe, farmers had their own plot. 
they had the plot of the Lord, which they had to work on, but they also had a communal a, a commons to, to, you know, to get um, collective stuff. So this is basically what Ostrom, Eleanor Ostrom has studied, right? She studied irrigation commons, forest commons, fisheries commons. So all these commons which, which coexisted in a authori authority ranking system as we explained. This is the, the third mode, authority ranking mode. But they lived in a symbiosis with the commons. Yeah. By the way, I just want to mention this briefly because some people say that the, you can only have commons when there are anti-capitalists, and this makes no sense to me. Because we had commons in the feudal system, compatible with the feudal system. Open source is a commons, it's compatible with capitalism. So there is no direct relationship between having a commons and, and having an anti-capitalist vision. It can, but it's not necessarily. So you cannot just say that commons are by, by nature anti-capitalist, they're not. They're only anti-capitalist if we make them anti-capitalist, right? But the commons can have post-capitalist features even in a capitalist system. So if you look at the definition of communism by Marx in the 19th century, so he said capitalism is commodity labor. He said socialism is to each according to our contribution, right? So you do something, you get a fair reward according to your contribution. And only then, when, as we reach abundance, we no longer have to look for contribution, we can start communism, which is to each according to need. That was his idea of these three steps. Now look at open source. What's happening in open source? Any coder can make open source, but any person in the world can use open source, right? So this is a communist logic, it's communal shareholding, that is entirely operating at the core of the capitalist system and is at this stage compatible with the capitalist system. This is very interesting, right? I don't think that was predicted uh, in Marxist theory. So the fact that at the core of value creation today we have these uh, systems. Now, I call them contributory systems because people contribute, but they are not socialist systems. They are not to each according to your contribution. They are actually communist systems to each according to need. Yeah? Uh, now, if you look at physical production or even blockchain uh, systems, and you know, they are starting to work with tokens, these are actually socialist systems, right? Or, or markets as well. But so what they're trying to do is to actually get rewarded for their work. So in a way they're going backwards from this communist system where the big danger and, and practice is you actually don't get paid for your work to, to attempts for these, from these workers to create systems where they can get rewarded. It's a bit strange. So it's not an evolutionary step, but it's an interesting uh, evolution. And I, I just want to tell you a little um, anecdote. So when I saw the Bitcoin emerging and the blockchain emerging, I was very critical because these are actually in many ways hyper-capitalist systems. I'll return to it in the next time, but so let's just take this. And so there is a danger for all people who are activists, which is ideological possession, right? Is that you're so steeped in your ideas that you filter the world and you, and you don't want to see things you don't like and you push them aside. This is very dangerous. I want to give you a good example of this, which I, I find really interesting. And maybe you'll think I'm right wing uh, when I explain this. But you probably saw this. This is such a good example. So you had this uh, Native American guy and this young guy. You, did you see that on CNN, probably? Yeah, so here's what the left says, right? So right wing, Trump supporter, disrespects elder Native American. And that was the first story we saw. And then they started actually showing the whole thing. It's a completely different story. So here's how it started. They had these black Israelites and the, native, the natives came, the Native Americans came. And these blacks started insulting the Native Americans. This was step one. So the black people were being racist <laughs> with the Indians, right? Okay, that kind of got uh, sold in some way, 
And then these kids started coming. And then these black Israelites started insulting the white, the white, the white youngsters. And of course, they're young, they're, you know, so something is happening. So more and more came, yeah? Okay, and this is where the story gets complicated. So the Native American says that he came drumming to make peace. That's what he says, right? But he was also in an interview on Democracy Now! And here's what he said. When I see these young boys, I'm thinking about lynching and I'm thinking about genocide. No, I'm sorry. These are just young kids, 14 year old. They're not the lynchers and they're not the genocide, right? But that's what he sees with his filtering. And then you have this one boy coming and he just stands still, he doesn't do anything, he smiles. Now, all the people on the left say he smirks. I watched it, I didn't see a smirk. What I'm trying to say is, is how you see things, right? It's, this is ideological possession. So you're on the left, you immediately see the story of racial domination by white people over a Native American elder. But you can see it differently. You could see it. So I actually see it differently because I saw the one hour and a half uh, filming and it's, it looks completely different. Uh, anyway, so that's ideological possession. So I was looking at blockchain with my ideological possession and I was saying, this is bad, this is hyper capitalistic, etc. And I still believe my analysis was, uh, you know, a right one, but it's a bit more complicated. So I, I went to a meeting in Chiang Mai, and Chiang Mai is one of the capitals of global nomadic work. So we have a, a Facebook page, it's called Chiang Mai Digital Nomads with 25,000 people. Of course, they're not always there, so I don't know how many there are, but there are a few thousand for sure. One of, the, one of the groups is the people working around Ethereum, Mozilla Foundation, they're all there. And I don't know if you know this, but there is today a big, big circuit of nomadic work. So mostly young people, um, you know, 20 to 35, roughly coders, designers, web marketeers. So anybody can work on the computer without having to be in one particular place. You can have clients in the whole world and you can work from wherever you are. So where do they go? They go to Chiang Mai, they go to Ubud in Bali, they go to Gran Canarias and Tenerife, they go to Medellin, and there's a whole network of, of places that attract these workers, and they don't stay in one place. I have a friend, he goes to three different places all the time. Um, and so I went, so we have, I don't know if it's still the case, but this was last year, we had four crypto meetings a week in Chiang Mai. Amazing. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is like the capital of the world in that, in that context, right? And so this guy was speaking, it was about a project called Give.eth, which is a peer-to-peer blockchain-based uh, uh, donation system. And here's what they were saying. The problem in Chiang Mai is that we cannot find anybody who wants to work for money anymore. Of course, he's only speaking about this particular environment, right? But he's speaking about a few hundred, if maybe even thousand people. And of course, this is all about the token economy, right? So the token economy, I had my shock then because I, I saw it slightly different. At the end of the 19th century, we had something called in, in, in Europe, we called Les Sublimes. And these were highly skilled craft workers. They only worked two or three days a week. And the bourgeoisie hated them because you know, they only had to work two, three days a week. So they were the ones doing you know, silver and gold and you know, old furniture, like very special skills, highly in demand. So they were a labor aristocracy, right? Now in the 70s, if you're in, in Europe, it were the plumbers. You know, if you were a plumber in Europe in the 70s, you were driving a Ferrari. So they were also a labor aristocracy because you had to wait six weeks to get a plumber. Now we have the Polish people, no problem. <laughs> but before, it was like that. So, the, so this is what it is, right? It's a labor aristocracy, but they've designed the tokens to their benefit as workers. So today, if you make tokens, you reserve 40% of the tokens for the work. So think about it 
10 years ago, you have to go to banks and venture capital, and they take equity, and you're a slave, even if you're an entrepreneur. One of the 100 companies will make it, and, and, and the 30 people on the top will get rich. Now we have a system where the coders get 40% of the income of the whole ecosystem. Interesting, right? This is class struggle 3.0. Uh, it I know it only affects a particular type of workers, but I think it's really interesting to see this happening because you know we can learn from them. And labor aristocracies have always been the ones leading the labor movements. It's a misconception that the labor movement came from the old, you know, from the industrial workers. It wasn't. It was the people in the factories that had skills that still had the memory of the guilds and of self-organization, not the poor peasants who were driven away illiterate to the cities and were dying when they were 35. It was the labor aristocracies who actually led the labor movement. So we'll come back to it when I give you a little class analysis, but I think today hackers, the hacker class, is key to social transformation because they're the ones involved in the commons. And if we are going to a commons transition, even though we have, you know, a proletariat, especially in Asia, like in Europe, it's going down, 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 but in Asia, it's going up, up, up. But who today can still believe that the industrial working class, maybe you do, I don't, I don't, will be the vanguard of a transformation? I don't think so, personally. We can discuss this in, a, in the discussion. But so today, the levers, the systemic levers of power are with the hacker class, right? The people dealing with symbols that are managing these whole, all the computer systems in the world. I think this is an important uh, point to make. Um, okay, so, I, I, sorry, I go from one to the other. So back to the history of the commons, and then I, this will be the end. So, yeah. pre-capitalist class systems, natural resource codes. What happens with capitalism is the enclosures, right? So in other words, the enclosures of the commons the chasing away of the farmers to the cities. So we have the first enclosures date actually to the 13th century when this English king, Henry VIII or the fourth, wanted to marry and the Catholic and the Pope said no. And so he, he, he actually closed down all the monasteries in, in England. And this is the first wave of commoning, of uh, decommoning, right? So all these people had no job anymore. They couldn't be monks. And so then the gentry, this is the, or, the original of capitalism, the gentry, new, a new capitalist class, started buying up land. And then in the 16th century, we have the second wave in, in Scotland. And this is a shift from, capital, from feudal property, which is a property which is based on lineage and is a collective property. So the duke cannot sell his land because it's not his land. It's just the first son, but he, you know, it's, the, it's the land of the lineage, right? So you preserve your land and you're the father of your serfs. You're supposed to be caring for them. This is the, the ideology at least, right? So we move to a capitalist property, which is absolute property, which is if I can make more money with sheep than with men, I'll chase away the men and I'll get in the sheep. So all the people were chased away and become the proletariat in the, in the English cities. This is starting in the 17th century. It's also described by Polanyi uh, in the Great Transformation. Um, so what happens then? So you're a worker, you're expelled to the city, you're barely literate, you die when you're 35, which is the case until 1850. And what do you do? Well, what you do is you create social commons. You create fraternities, you create pension funds, funeral funds, you create uh, healthcare uh, solidarity. So this is, for me, is the commons. It's the uh, second wave of commons, which is if you, you no longer have natural resources, you're property less as a, proleta as a proletarian, but what you will do is you create solidarity mechanisms. You mutualize life risk. This is the second wave of the commons. We didn't see that way, but I think we should see it that way. So for me, the labor movement is also to a large degree an expression of a return to the commons. 
to all these social solidarity mechanisms. So if the natural resource commons were privatized and decommunified, what happened with the labor commons? They were nationalized, right? So the welfare system is a taking over of the commons of the working class and organizing them as a bureaucracy from the state. This is also decommunification. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, because actually, if you look at the figures, the social commons of the working class never reached more than 20% of the population. Yeah? So in other words, it was only for committed activist workers who believed in this system and were maintaining them. The great mass of the people did not benefit from these solidarity systems. It's only when it became a right, a civic right, that 100%, at least in Europe, 100% of the workers benefited from social security. So we paid the price of decommunification to make it a public good instead of a commons good. Then the third step is knowledge commons. So this is basically what brought me to the commons. Um, I discovered the internet in 1993, and remember October 93 for me is the big moment. It's the invention of the browser and the web. So this is when the internet moves from being a small scientific community to a civic uh, community, right? This is, this is starts in 93. This is when, and now we have two billion people on Facebook, this is when a huge mass of literate people got socialized through shared knowledge. I don't know for you, but for me this is a very important moment. This is the Trojan horse of the commons. Until that time we had neoliberal dominance, meaning they had succeeded in telling us that the only way to advance society is through, is through competition. Yes, we had civil society organizations, but they were reactions. You know, like, like uh, religious congregations, you, you, take, you do charity. They were, ne they were not systemic like the labor movement. They were just like managing the excesses of the system. So, you know, you, you come home tired and then you'll become an activist. If you're not lucky to be paid by Oxfam or something. But anyway, so that was the idea. The idea then was still society is a com competing firms, they create the wealth in the market, and then we redistribute, right? That was the idea. I think a shift happens when more and more people said, and that's what happened to me, wow, we can work together. We can share knowledge every day. And the next step was very easy. Why can't we do that with the rest of our life, right? Because a lot of the things, if you're a 60s person like I was, I was premature, I was 10 years old, but I still remember it as if, it, as if I was there. Your life was one of defeats, right? If you're an activist from the 60s, you lived through Reagan and Thatcher, and everything was going in the wrong way, <laughs> right? So, um, so for me, this is a very important moment. So the rediscovery by large and larger groups in society, especially educated, knowledge workers that you could share and that sharing was the way to advance. And this is very important also sociologically because what happens is if you're a worker in a factory, you can build natural solidarity with all the people around you. It's based on, it's based on territory, right? We all work in the same factory. We have the same boss. It's us against them. This is how you build a labor movement or a union. It's, it's you know, you're all oppressed by the same people. You can see them. You can point to them, and it's easy to, to build an antagonistic uh, social movement, right? What if you're a knowledge worker, and you work with projects, and every six months, you're working on another project? Like, where's your solidarity? Your, well, your solidarity is in the network, right? You're building relationships in the network. Like, where can I find knowledge that I don't have, but I need for my work? This is a community that has that knowledge. I can learn there, right? How do I find a job? Et cetera, et cetera. So here's the main idea is that we go from territorial organization to virtual nation organization, yeah? So knowledge workers organize themselves not based on territory, but on affinity. 
and this also changed the way you think about social struggle because like where's the enemy you know you know what i mean it's com it's more complicated right and anyway to conclude uh, so natural commons social commons knowledge commons urban commons fourth step so i did a study in ghent in 2016 uh, for the for the city officials, 80 interviews, nine workshops for every provisioning system, and we find out that there was a tenfold increase of urban commons in 10 years. So there were 50 in 2006 and 500 in 2016. There's been studies in Sp Spain, in the Netherlands, in Belgium as a whole to confirm this. So there is today a rapid emergence of urban commoning and so the way I would explain it to you is that the same people who got socialized with the internet faced with the crisis of 2008 and with climate change and many other things decided to do to say there is market failure there is state failure we're going to organize ourselves and they have the technological capacity to do this right so this is the fourth step the fifth step is already visible so most of the urban commons are redistributive commons. So housing commons, community land trusts, housing co-ops, and, and um, what's it called? Uh, the third thing, the bricks, the land, the bricks, and the service, co-housing, right? So you have a community land trust for the land. You build a housing co-op to maintain low rent. And then you do co-housing to mutualize services. You have this in Ghent. But this is redistribution mostly. So you're not building the house yet, right? But in, in food and in energy, we're already doing this. So in, in, in Germany, 60% of the energy, renewable energy is done by community-owned, civically-owned energy co-ops. So in other words, we're, we're further into what I call cosmo-local production, the fifth step of the commons, moving from pure redistribution to actually making things in a new way. And you look at these systems and you can see the change. It's ecosystem oriented. You have, okay, and, and this is my conclusion. Okay, by, by giving you an example from Brazil, it's called Curto Café. I think I, I explained that yesterday, but I'll just do it uh, back today because it, it shows how seed forms become operative, right? So how, how these things come together. So Curto Café is a community or an ecosystem of production and consumption in Brazil that was created by an executive, former executive of a coffee company. And about 10, 15 years ago, he asked himself, why is it that we cannot have good coffee in Brazil why? Because A, B, C, D, and the best categories are exported, so they get the, the, the worst coffee stays in the country. And that we make coffee, and the people who make the coffee are starving. So the, the, the farmers who make the coffee are very, very poor. Whenever there's a crisis, they go under the, the poverty level. So his, his question was, how can we make good coffee without exploiting those workers? Well, you can already see, this is not capitalism, right? This is not... How can I make something in order to make a profit? This is not exchange value rent already. His, his very question is post-capitalist because it's use value oriented, making good coffee. And it's also generative and not extractive. That's also post-capitalist vision, right? Generative forms of economy which don't exploit nature and people. So here's what he did. And every step that I'm going to explain to you is a seed form of the commons and is a proof that it works. Um, first step is that we're not going to do fair trade because it's expensive and it makes us dependent on Western NGOs. Yeah? Because fair trade is nice, but it's still... It's still based on a producer-consumer model and some, somebody in between managing the ecosystem, which is different from the players, right? So he said, we're going to do this differently. We're going to do 
not fair trade, but feral trade, F-E-R-E-L. In other words, fully, full transparency. In other words, we will use the internet to show people where we buy our coffee from, from whom, and how much we pay. Step one. This was impossible before the internet. Impossible. Step two. Just as with distributed, uh, distributed manufacturing, with 3D printing, we're going to make coffee burning machines that are smaller and that we can place with the farmers. Step two, this quadruples the income of the farmers. They get four times, four times more than before. These are new types of distributed machinery that didn't exist 15 years ago, right? It's like the 3D printing model, but adapted to coffee machines. Step three, we're going to create a coffee commons, meaning all the blends, all the recipes, we're going to share them for the whole community. No, tr no, no proprietary knowledge, but a commons. Step three, you see what I'm, what I'm getting at? We already have three seed forms getting together in one system. Step four, we're not going to look for capital with private capital. We're going to do crowdfunded retail expansion. So just like energy co-ops, you buy a share and you get energy. You buy a share and you get coffee. So basically their community prepays the rent and in exchange they get free coffee. That allows them to have shops and in the shops they sell the coffee. They have a poster explaining how much the coffee costs and why. So every step of the, of the supply chain is open, transparent and shared. They don't have cashiers. They have basically a machine where you put money or not. So this is like a pay what you want system, but most people pay that or more. And basically you put the money in a box and you get a plastic coin and you, you, you get the coffee. They started with a small shop and today, I didn't see it, but they told me, I was in Brazil uh, just a month ago, uh, you know, they, they told me they have two big warehouses and they are all full, full of people, always, all the time. So in other words, it works. Yeah, this is very interesting. It works. And this is not a company. This is a community, an ecosystem of various players who are together in one ecosystem. Just as you have community-supported agriculture, you have farmers and consumers making a deal with each other and making an ecosystem. It's not an antagonistic worker capital system. It's a system with a e where the ecosystem is a commons. It's a common infrastructure, and the various stakeholders find ways to cooperate together in win-win uh, kind of situations. So I hope that makes sense. And so this is how I see society evolving, right? It's by inventing all these seed forms, slowly they come together, and people will make a mix of one or two, maybe still within a capitalist environment. And something we go further and we'll say, well, we want to change the complete market relation that we have with, okay, I'll talk to, about this another time, but this is, this is uh, all these seeds that are sprouting and make subsystems, and of course my idea is that at one point in the future these subsystems might connect and become the new system, where the commons is the center, you have a generative market and a partner state, but that's for another time. Thank you.